All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I'm extremely excited for today's episode here on uh, our Starfort series, episode two, with a, I'm sure it is going to be a beautiful presentation uh, by Matt from the Great Deception podcast. But before we do that, I just want to introduce a very special guest we have with us today on our end from the Generation Z uh, Patreon family, as we call it, uh, Mason from Schumann Beings. Brother, how are you doing today? What's up, man? I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. Glad to have you, dude. Awesome. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. And of course, we have Matt. How are you today, brother? Oh, I'm stoked for this, guys. Thanks for having me. Sweet, sweet. Thank you for coming on so much. And of course, we have Brandon. How you going? How you doing? Ah, Are we still doing that? <laughs> hey, guys. Good to see you all. This is awesome. I'm super pumped about it. And thank you all uh, for doing this. And thank everybody for listening and watching. Awesome. Well, uh, Matt, you have the ability to share your screen, I believe. And the floor is yours, sir. All right. So we will pick up uh, where we left off last time. And what we have here is the, actually, let me get rid of, actually, I'll keep those on the side. The narrative of the United States in Star Forts. And supposedly over 91 Star Forts were built in the U.S. in the 1950s alone. Um, and if we look here, you know, we just go through these slides real quick and just look at a couple of them. What you're going to see is you're going to see they do vary in size and scope and, and some of the and shape. And what we talked about last time when we, we started looking um, at briefly at the oscillator and the different shapes that were formed by different frequencies. Um, now, to give you a, a scope of some of these, I know in these little pictures, they don't look that impressive. For example, Fort Jefferson here in, in the Florida Keys, 16 million bricks it took to build. And we looked at it last time. It's the one they built in the middle of the ocean. Um, just a massive complex. So when we look at these, what's interesting is, again, I like to look at the shapes um, I like to, because when we look at the shapes here and, and, and what I like about this view is you get to see multiple forts in one and you start to see certain patterns. You start to see certain features that are present in all of them. And, and, and what I look at are the points, right? Because when we talked about this last time, there's something to the points and where they're pointing, the direction that they're pointing. And, and it seems like the fort is also built off a center point. And that's, that's the other area you kind of want to look at when we look at these things. Um, here, here's just some more of them. Again, these are just, you know, they vary in, in size and scope. Some are on the water directly, you know, on the coastline. Some are slightly inward. But again, almost all of them, unless they're on a hilltop, directly involve water. Now, what we're starting to find also, the ones on the hilltop, tend to have a water source underneath the hilltop. So they are, for the most part, in close proximity to water. And as we talked about before, and as we'll get into today, uh, some of the frequency, some of the um, oscillation, different properties, uh, different water shapes and sizes based on frequencies, the impact of, of frequency on water. Now, this one I found interesting because I, I was researching uh, Old World Chicago, and I came across this map. And on this little map, there was a, you know, what you would appear to be a star fort right in Chicago in 1773. Um, on any of the other research I've done, I've never found this, this fort yet. So if anyone has some information on it, please feel free to send it to me because I'm interested by this. I found nothing more than this little map. But Again, they're, they're all over, um, all over the world, um, and we don't really know. We're, we're told the defensive batteries, but now what we're going to get into today in this part of it is more of the frequency, vibration, sound, shape side of things. And this is where you have to break the program thinking. OK, and, and you, there's going to be a lot of people, not your audience, Dave, but a lot of normal people that would just say, oh, this is dumb right here. I'm going to look at this slide. I'm done. I'm out. You guys are talking about auras and things like that. I mean, this is this is voodoo. But when we think about auras, we're thinking about magnetic fields. Right. And, and all the different effects that magnetic fields have on not only the human body, but what we found on animal life, plants, all sorts of carbon based life. And now what we're also looking into here is, well, 
how do these magnetic fields and these frequencies impact or work with buildings like cathedrals, like churches? How, how do the organs function, the windows, um, the placement on the earth? Do they lay on ley lines and things like that? And, and so we're going to look at all sorts of different things. You know, I, I like to, you know, we, we deem it geomancy, right? The way that the lay of the land, uh, we'll look at some harmonics. Um, oscill uh, some oscillators, because that's where that's what really kind of turned me in a different direction with the star forts into more so than just being a defensive battery. Um, so uh, here's a quick video. Um, and, and what it says here, and basically what it's going to show you is the effect of frequency. And this is like a water based plate with some gold flakes on it. And we're just going to see what it does. Okay, so basically, yeah, what they're saying there is if a single frequency can impact that much, think about what music or multiple frequencies could do, right? And Dave, this ties in again with your crop circles, right? And I, I thought I, I found this and that's why I put that in there because they were talking about how the crop circles, they, they tend to represent these frequency patterns. Could I jump in real quick? Go right ahead. We thank you. Just wanted to see if you wanted to finish your presentation first, or if, uh, if if I could jump in. But all right. Not only that. Recently, I've been toying with the idea that there are not two strands to our DNA, but three. And the third one is that that rod down the middle. Now, here's what's interesting. There, it's in academic papers, public articles, you name it. The human body has, I believe, zero point zero two or zero zero two percent of gold in it. I believe that that third strand, that junk DNA, is both biologically non-local and ha has the ability to be non-local, like in quantum physics, but is, um, is physically within us, in the physical, down to the literally the billionth of a nanoscale. And it is, co it is covered with sprinkled gold over top of it. And it's interesting that you play this video. Because look what happened to here when you add gold dust to this surface. What happens if we find out, for example, what our internal DNA, the gold within it can do? I, I, I find that quite peculiar because that speaks to the, the possibility that uh, neutrinos um, carry information, but apparently they're not strong enough to carry information, except if it has a conductor. I think the conductor is us. And I think oh. those star forts for example, maybe not all, but a fair percentage of them. I think what, what we're seeing there is a beam, a neutrino beam, as we call it, being shot through the planet as a stargate, as a, a, a something, uh, not necessarily needing to be a stargate, but enabling some type of, oh, I don't know, testing of, you know, reverse engineered ET craft at such bases. I don't, I don't think it's a fluke that the geometry is so, the, the vortices, the axioms line up perfectly with um, what's called scalar commensurability in zero point en uh, energy. So first off, thank you so much, man, for, for throwing that in there, truly. And then think about sure. um, the stories of Sitchin with the Anunnaki. You know, what was the obsession? What did they breed oh. humans for? You know, and that's all like coded, right? And then you think about what was maybe what the, the mana or whatever, but there was also a monatomic gold that was sought after. And this is stuff that, you know, is coveted. This is what alchemy they say is all about. Alchemy is about a lot of things, but that's, that's what they say. One of the things is, is it's actually monatomic gold because of how it interfaces with us. It's fascinating, Matt. Great. Good call, dude. Absolutely. And, and so we'll move, this is more along the lines of what we were talking about last time with the, um, with the different types of stone, right? And we, we were mentioning limestone um, and granite and things like that. And that's, I pulled these clips from a video from Robert Borman on YouTube. So anybody that wants to uh, check it out, I, I can send you the link, but it's in here too. 
Um, but what he, he showed on these slides is he said the materials were chosen carefully. Limestone, a rock that is associated with water and properties of female energy, and the granite and firestone with male energy. Consequently, the buildings are charged with positive and negative polarity. Real interesting. Um, and then he said, just like an electrical circuit, it is not by accident that such a techniques are identical to those used in pyramids and stone chambers whose geometric and electric properties are also known to affect the human body, which we just talked about. And then you had, uh, I had long postulated that the lowers were powerful amplifiers of radio resonance from the atmosphere generated by lightning flashes around the world. Now, you know, like we talked about last time, it may not just be the lightning flashes, but, you know, cathedrals, different points, um, bells, different frequencies that are put out there that could be or act as resonators. Um, now, this, this is another very interesting point when we think about the shape, okay? Um, this looks at the frequency and the wavelengths, but it looks at fractal antennas. And one of the things that's interesting that she'll point out here is that the more points that the, uh, the more times the fractal repeats, the more that the fractal antenna will receive more and more signals. So, which is, is very interesting when we look at some of the, that would explain why these star forts have the different points on the outside. Now, let me let her explain it much better than I can. One side of the coach strip plate will turn into after the first repetition, we'll get three times four to the first, or 12 sides. After the second repetition, we'll get three times four to the second, or 48 sides. At the repetition of the end, we'll have three times four to the third. antennas have to pick up the one type of signal, and they usually work best with their lengths of certain multiples of their signals. So, FM radio antennas can only pick up FM radio stations, TV antennas can only pick up TV channels, and so on. The fractal antennas are different. As the fractal repeats itself more and more, the fractal antenna can pick up more and more signals, not just one. And because the perimeter of the coke snowflake grows way faster than its area, the fractal antenna only takes up a quarter of the usual space. In reality, uh, this cannot make a small sort of like the first initial wave range. So this uh, starting wave range is big. We need bigger size. So we don't know what frequency we need, but we can say that we have preemptive fractal antenna and the first uh, preemptive wave range was pretty big. Then was the lowest frequency was pretty big, but the highest frequency was, say, infinite. What we do? We just take a normal uh, antenna, normal line, and then we need fractal as much as we can as many times. Triangle, triangle, double, double, so on. But triangle box is not the only fractal. We can use quadrant. So thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, I mean, automatically comes to mind the Tataria buildings or whatever the big cathedrals, uh, Chinese uh, towers, you know, with the outscoot roof and they're layered. They're obviously not for overhang water protection. Maybe the lowest one is, but the others are not. They look like a clear antenna. Uh, you've got countless examples of this, but the fact that just like that video uh, articulated, they don't have to be metal to be antennas. And another interesting thing is why don't we make I mean, as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, why don't we make satellite dishes like that star pattern, you know? And perhaps the reason is, is because they only want us picking up frequencies in the circle pattern and that they don't want us absorbing these frequencies from that type of shape. Now I just want someone to make a damn 
a satellite dish or something like that and see what you can hear or see what you can receive and furthermore change it you know you could even make it wire and kinetic to where it can move based on you know you flip a switch and then it goes to another pattern and see what you come up with and then maybe even record and layer all those to see if there's something deeper going on this is a whole a whole damn thing and the fact again that it doesn't have to be metal these buildings themselves the stone itself and even when you break down cooperative materials like red and black granite and the limestone used in pyramids used in all sorts of things that then people will point at to say look piezo electricity there's a conductiveness to this dude awesome matt awesome dude so i to your guys's points to both matt's fantastic way of presenting it brother and also to to what brandon just said this is something, and I, I promise to, to lay it all out in layman's terms. This is something that, I mean, you want to talk about synchronicities, coincidences, whatever you want to call it, that I was just working on about an hour ago looking into. This speaks to something called the directionality of scalar commensurability. And what that essentially means is it allows the task to define the tool that is needed based on the uh, the, the perception of the photon way, uh, photon um, uh fluctuations into the spectrum of the eye. So what that can do is utilize something called kinematic geometries or non-Euclidean planar algebras. And essentially what that is, is it's a build upon of the Cartesian plane, but just like the Tribonacci sequence compared to the Fibonacci sequence, the Tribonacci sequence is harder to produce than it is to prove. So I think what we're looking at here is using Right, ang uh, right angles via something called discrete and indiscrete topology, where it doesn't touch any of the vortices that we are supposed to be seeing within the light spectrum, but we are not because of some type of confinement. And so I think what we're seeing here is the fractalization of the ripple within the right angle view of that. So in other words, it's basically, I think there are other nodes that lock over top like Matryoshka dolls or like, you know, Russian uh, dolls in that sense, but it's, they're locking in, but they're not locking in relative to the vibrational spin rotation that we have. So if we, could you go back to slide uh, 66, if that's cool, brother? Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So we see here the magnetic field around, around a human body we call an aura. Some people say, how can we detect, how can we don't detect any magnetic fields around this, around the, um, around any of the star forts? Let's just say hypothetically, because if you can postulate an axiom or a vortex using non-locality uh, along any ley line, I think what you can then have is oscillation using discrete topology that does not require a magnetic force because in that case the magnetic force or conductor would be us so what you have is individuals within that 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 military base or that star fort or whatever you would like to call it the actions and the intent within the entropic state the entropy of the fort is defined within what's called the levi chavita space-time metric so th that's the space between space so in other words, this is fantastic. Th thank you. A hundred percent. And then think of this, man, to Dave, to what you said. Um, we've seen those pictures of the beams coming out of the ground or coming to the ground, right? Well, what if they're not coming from space or whatever? They're coming out of the ground in a cylindrical type of a pattern from what we can see from a side view way off and it's glowing. Perhaps if you adjusted the contrast on that, it would look more or resemble more to a fractal type of a pattern. So then this makes me think of maybe you could flip it too, by the way, so you, you could flip it to make it look like to us, it's coming from the sky when it would be coming from the earth. A hundred percent. You just play the video in reverse. Now, the other thing about this is, is that you um, think about this, maybe the energetic centers are already there and that, that every now and then they're produced by this ley line or on this area or whatever. But what the star forts would then represent at that point, instead of it being the key, they would be the lock. So basically they're built to mimic the receptive part of that energy, you know, or to focus it in some way to catch it maybe. And so this pattern kind of funnels things in or draws in the energy and the more points, the different frequencies. And this perhaps is why they're shaped differently. And again, with the water, again, with the building materials, it's just interesting, man. I love it all. And this, you know, the energetic component to this, I think is very, very important. I think they're, they're really onto something here, dude. Mason, brother, did you want to jump in before Matt goes on? 
Yeah, just uh, if I could try to even explain, like, because I, I can process it in here, but like to put it into words, it's, it's, <laughs> it's hey, you, you know what I mean? Welcome, welcome but, um, to my struggle, man. <laughs> right, right. But man, like the first thing, like, you know, when I when I saw those images, the first thing I was thinking is like uh, almost like snowflakes. And I was thinking about water molecules and going back to like, you know, the, the previous video about like the semantics, you know, and I was I, I was trying to visualize like what would these actually like be doing and then and then I had the the idea of like it's almost like an atom and like there's like a nucleus and like that's like the energy concentration and then the people around it if, if thinking in terms of it being like a water molecule because the symbol still has the I don't know what the word would be but like it still has the intent like it still has the hey, can like I regardless of what it's made of Right. You know, like it's it's still and that kind of almost reminds me of like uh some of the other stuff Dave that you've been uh in your other content about how like the uh the toroidal the torus and like the different shapes and how it you know has different symbols different meanings and like to me the way I see it it's almost like the intent of the people that gather around these like star forts or whatever these things are it's almost like it amplifies that it, if it, that makes sense it, it's literally to your point mason like the matryoshka dolls and the mm -hmm. that's the concept of for example if you postulate a vortice or an axiom that's basically using intent to basically right say, this is the focal point or the the starting point of something which could be what we call geometric nodes or vortices or vortexes right and it's again an what is an atom as i under, as we understand it you know based on quantum physics now it, an atom is just a cloud of a bunch of particle uh, uh, particle fluctuations. So exactly again, the same idea would be in this fantastic slide that Matt has here, slide 66. You see how the auras, even in this visual, whether it was intended or not, you see how purple overlaps blue, then lighter blue, then green, then yellow. It's like the Matryoshka dolls. It locks over top because in this case, the chakras would be the atoms or the, the axioms or the points. Right. And in this case, we would be those particles surrounding right. it. And that's the whole, that's the third strand of DNA right down the center. Because the other two, the other two strands are interlacing. So to both of your guys' points, that was great. So cool. Excellent. All right. So now we're going to take a look at the oscillator and the oscillation process. And so we, we again, we're going to get into sound, right? Sound is just vibration in the ether. So what does vibrations do? They affect, they disturb, they excite all the magnetic fields that they can touch. Um, and our body is one of those. Um, so if we look at the different frequencies that sound and, and vibrations have, and then the effects that they have on our bodies and our minds, you, you get the, you know, the terms good vibes and bad vibes. And so when we start looking at this, we start looking at cymatics right? Which is it, that it will show us the different geometrical shapes um, and the magnetic fields that they take um, when they're exposed to different vibrations and different frequencies. So, you know, star fort shapes, um, they, you know, most likely rep represent the beneficial effects of the area, right? When they're exposed to the right frequencies and vibrations. So you mix that with the water and everything and, and, and these patterns start showing up. So what, what are they? Well, we think they may be a way to create energy, you know, in the environment that's fractal, okay? And that also is life enhancing, life beneficial. Like we talked about before, most star forts are, are on or near or around water. And then here's where, um, what you were saying, Mason, with, with Dr. Emoto and, and the frozen water, that different frequencies, um, create the same types of patterns that we see in the star forts. So what, and what kind of patterns do you see? They're all sacred geometry, right? They're all sacred geometric patterns in the waters and in the star forts. So um, let's just take a look at one right here. So if we look at this oscillator as it goes through, we're gonna see all these star forts we saw in part one take shape right in here. And so you can, I mean, you can stop this at any point and, you know, you're going to see one of the star forts that we've looked at. That is, and, uh, you know, sorry, Matt, that, that's what I meant by, uh, that's precisely, this is a beautiful visual of discrete topology. 
it's not touching any of the other vortices, but it's still staying within itself by bending, twisting. And that's like in the, the movie Inception, when they went on the stairs there, they're moving up, but they weren't increasing in height. That's right. the same thing as the grandfather paradox example. If you looked at it from a 2D perspective of the toroid field, that this man, if you could send me this video after, I'll, I'll message you. But this is great. Sure, definitely. You could take any of these still images and use it as a blueprint for these star forts, which is yes. crazy interesting. And which means that the different frequencies match directly. So all you have to do is look up, oh, what made that pattern? Find another one, find that frequency, and automatically you'd start cataloging them based on frequencies. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's why this is just it's so fascinating to look at because you see, I mean, from beginning to end, these are all different star fort layouts. Yep. And uh, it's one of those where. Well, all right. So what did you think of that, guys? What the heck? That was an oscillator. And the uh, oh. we love the it's, my, it's easily one of my favorite accents. That, no, that's in that's in this. That's it's from autodidactic when he he pulled it love it um but you look at the different oscillations and then we get into here again we go back to what we looked at the first time with the different frequencies and the vibrations and the patterns that they create so and what you'll notice in these is is they're giving the down here in the lower left you'll see the different frequency and how the pattern changes here. I just want to send a shout out out to who, whatever stoner scientist came up with this experiment. Cause you know, some dude was just like, I'm going to put a plate on a speaker, bro. I'm I like how you went from either end of the shit. spectrum. It's either yeah. got a stoner or scientist. It's not, both. <laughs> it's not mutually exclusive. He's, he's a hip guy. This is so cool. Simon X is so interesting. There's just, I oh, think it, so it really is. It's sa the sound, right? The sound the vibrations, everything it's, it's, it's what we are. We are, you know, just vibrating uh, particles. And, you know, so that gets us into thinking about sound. Well, where have we heard sound used as a weapon, right? In Joshua in, in Jericho, right? That's the obvious example of it. And, and so we start looking into it. And now this is where, this is new to, to my presentation. Um, and it's thanks to Paul at What the Flock TV. And he's big into Janus. So when I started looking at that, that ties in with not this piece, but the next piece. What we have here is the Ouroboros, right? And anyone, I don't, I don't know if everyone is familiar with it, but it's kind of the symbol for um, the eternal, like cyclical renewal of life, the cycle of life, death, rebirth, the whole process. Um, and so if we think about, you know, some people say that it has, you know, negative connotations because it's, you know, traced to the moon cults. Um, and, you know, when we think about the moon, the moon served as the timekeeper, right? Um, so the natural keeper of time, the cycle also, of time. You also have the Saturn moon matrix. There's been a lot of allegations that the moon is a harvester of multiple kinds of energies, particularly feminine energies and what have you, but absolutely to your point. Yeah. And Dave, yeah. And one of the things, uh, look at the symbol. This is a synchronicity for Dave and I from about five hours ago. We just talked about the psychronography. This is insane, dude. Go ahead, Matt. I just wanted to point yep. out the synchronicity. Thing. No. And that's why, cause I, I hadn't seen this pattern before. And then all of a sudden we were playing around with the oscillator and I saw this and I'm like, I, I, cause I was looking at 
the element chart and I was like, oh my God, there's the Ouroboros. And, and I, I looked at it again and I was like, no way. I'm like, it really is. It eats its tail right here and then just keeps going. And so, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say as well, the Ouroboros of it eating its tail. Again, this is literally deja vu of what Brandon and I were, were discussing and looking at earlier, but it speaks to, um, in my opinion, a concept of from a quote unquote scientific sense. But again, we can argue, you know, based on, you know, the derivation of Latin and all that with the English language, it's just other words to define this. But the whole thing is that if we think of the concept of magic as say, you know, electromagnetic frequencies, for example, and we think about th this Ouroboros, the snake eating itself in that cyclical sense, what you have, as I understand it within quantum physics is that there's no such thing as empty space. What's happening is that everything within the space-time metric is doing its quote-unquote quantum dance. So you have one instance, again, it's the concept of duality, one circle, if you will, of entropy that encompasses particle fluctuations. Another one is the vacuum of zero-point energy. So what happens is that the particle fluctuations go into the vacuum, and the vacuum spits out a whole new set of those particle fluctuations, almost as if for better or worse, that's the whole concept of scalar oscillations in a in a commensurability sense because it's scalars in magnitude and not in any particular direction. So it's almost as if our bioresonant frequencies, like on slide 66 there, from an electromagnetic sense, because the, the, the third strand of the chakras is the conductor, is emitting particle fluctu um, uh, excuse me, emitting energies such as anxiety from anxiety, stress, depression, that then add into the particle fluctuations that cycle that into the ether and the ether spits out quote unquote fresh particles for us to re, I, I don't want to say infect, but they, uh, they spit out resonant particles, which is what's very interesting because right. this is where the Ouroboros come. You know, this is what we talked about earlier is that it's going to spit out what you are. This is what man manifestation and all of the stuff about. This is why photons, Dave, this is what we talked about earlier on our last episode, by the way. You guys definitely check it out. And uh, not, so, not, not to go negative, but we can argue that's also the feeding of the loosh. Yeah. Oh, of course. In any direction. That's what I'm saying. You get back what you put into the system. What you eat is what you're that's your echo. This is like your past, right? You know, so what you've put out to manifest is coming through. You're eating that experience now. And this is a regenerative way. And not only does it fuel you for the, to stick with the metaphor for sustenance, but also it could be a way we experience this reality. Uh, Dave, uh, to talk about earlier was photons come to your eyes, but they don't come out. But what may come into your eyes is your perception of reality. And then it, you know, f manifests in front of you in a new way whatever you are so it, it, new particles that come out are at resonant frequency for whatever you are vibing at right this is why the concept of like attracts like all of this stuff so this could be also how you generate your own reality because as you take in information you assess it you process and then you're based on your vibrational state new things come at you this is why you don't deal with assholes anymore once you stop becoming an asshole and because they just don't come around anymore you don't manifest that back into your reality so this is deep as shit matt this is cool and i just wanted to give if that's cool matt so sorry man uh, uh, mason you want to jump in brother uh, yeah, just real quick. Um, and this is just, this is amazing stuff. And Brandon, you kind of you almost said what I thought you were going to say and, and, and mentioning the the human resonance in this. But I, I think it all kind of ties into to the way we interact, you know, with the energy that we output and input. And like when I look at these these images, the spirals there, the Ouroboros is like, you know, going back to what we were just talking about, like I see it's almost like that center, you know, area and then what looks like almost like the energy of people around it, you know, and it, like, I, I, Dave, I sent you something in the, in, on Telegram a while back about like what I was postulating or theorizing about like centrifugal and centripetal time and like the way uh, like magnets move where there's like the centerpiece moving in one direction and then the, the centrifugal, I, I get them back mixed up the centrifugal and centripetal, but basically the way they move like this and like, an inward outward motion and like that's what i see happening here and like the same thing with intent and like what the human resonant basically puts out in terms of its frequency and vibration versus what we put back and that kind of pushback and i see the same thing when i look at the at the human charts where i i see you know the frequencies and, and like whatever's going on there but then there's also stuff that it's like doesn't seem natural it's almost like something interfering with it and that's where i've i've for a long time like you know seen where we kind of affect it. And I think this all kind of is, is like 
I feel like we're like right at the edge of like understanding all this, but uh, welcome to the show, Mason. We're glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, just like my brain is like going a million miles an hour, and I'm trying to like oh, yeah. I'm like how do I slow this down like one idea at a time. <laughs> Well, yeah, Mason, and too, and and you look at the oscillator videos, right? And and what mm-hmm. the only constant was the center point, right? And you watch the center point; that was the only thing that stayed constant. Everything else changed around it. All the energy around it changed based on the frequency that was output, which yeah. is it is right along with what you're saying and how you know with the Schumann resonance. Right. And this is what we were talking about earlier today with the observer effect and the right angles. And whenever you're standing at a lake with a bunch of point of points of light on the other side at night, they all focus to you, the observer. And it does this for every mm-hmm. observer present. And so this idea, again, uh, with the center point, Matt, exactly what you said, dude, being the same, that you basically are the observer and the frequency at the same time. So mm-hmm. you are affecting the frequency, which affects you, which that's where we get this. Um, th- Mason, exactly what you were talking about, dude. All of it's amazing, gentlemen. My apologies. Keep going, Matt crushing it dude so now here's where i gotta give credit to paul from what the flock tv because i had never gotten big into janice and for anyone who hasn't really looked into janice the the roman god look into it because a lot of this old world stuff that we look into ties to janice so you know go give paul's work a look because he breaks it down unlike anyone else i've ever ever seen before But what we have is Janus is the god of gods, okay? And some of you may have seen it before. The most uh, known is the two-headed being, right? One looking forward, one looking back. Well, if we we look at his name and remember that there weren't really J's back then, so his name really would have been Ionis. Um, It means arched passageway or door. We see a lot of those arches, those passageways throughout the realm, right? All over the globe. They had a big significance in the world's fairs and things like that. So this Giannis character taught man to make walls to surround a city. And as soon as I heard that, I thought star forts. I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's start getting into what his some of his other things he's the god of keys and i was like oh my gosh frequency frequency keys freaking you know cymatics i'm like oh and then you look at him he's the god of the skeleton key he's the light bearer he plays the prometheus character he's the king of the airways right so you think about all this frequency and all this stuff going on in the airway well if he's the king of it he and he's setting up these um walled cities are they the control of the airwaves and again you know Giannis is the ether um he's the all he's number 11 um he's the god of arches and entrances exits and passages um and then you think about what art arches are they're transistors right they, they can impact moods and control the flow and amplify energy um they're like a giant magnet in a sense. You know, and then you look at like- Giannis a little further. He's the God of gates. He's the chain God of change and transitions. He's the God of time, duality, doorways, the God of transition between war and peace. And then he has the two heads. So he's the God of beginnings and endings, forwards and backwards, inside and out. And we see this throughout time. You know, you think about the two headed Eagle, Right. That's what came to mind with me. I was like, oh, that's just another version of Janice. Um, and you guys want to chime in on that one? I mean, I, I'm thinking of like Teotihuacan, uh, the Garden, uh, the Gate of the Gods, like all of this stuff, the reverence for these passages or these transitional states. And so that's what's interesting, too, is they're, they're a state from either inside to outside, from this side of the arch to the other. They're treated like portals. And now I'm thinking like it's maybe on the inside of the stones, like on the back of them, they carve some sort of spell or something that affects everyone that walks through it, almost like an indoctrination, almost like a physical alteration to your chemistry. Wow. And then you're talking about vibration and stuff, and who knows? Because if you're funneling everyone through this arch, and you think about uh, the one in 
France. It's like in the middle of the damn roundabout, the True de Roll, whatever it's called. I can't, I don't remember what it's called. Arch de Triomphe. Thank you very much. And so they, what the hell, you know, they're cool, but really they're portal states. And I mean, all sorts of things with this. And so, yes, they would in, influence or amplify the influence of an area. It's very interesting that. You, you said, Brandon, funneling something through art. What was that there? Funneling through yeah. art? Yeah, because you're funneling like people. Like if you think about it, like in this example, um, the people aren't going in the other doors. They're going to want to go through the Grand Arch and stand under it and walk under it. And so it entices you to transition in this medium, no matter how oh many doors are there, from God. one space to the next. It's the most enticing thing. So you would ensure then by making it so grand and ornate that one would be enticed to pass through it just through our natural. And look at the, yep, the one your mouse is over there with the other columns. Everybody, you know, there's folks standing around, but you're going to go through that arch. And so, and if not, most people are going to go through that arch and now, they're going to be more affected by whatever it's for. To you that, know, oh, sorry, Matt, please. No, 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 go ahead. I, I want to, I just want to, I want to show you guys this for a second too, because uh, this is pretty crazy, Brandon. I was just talking about uh, the Chicago World's Fair recently, and this is on top of the arch. So there it is. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And this is what the people were walking through to enter the Chicago World's Fair. And also San Francisco, they had one that had a similar quote on it. And think about prophetic messages at the top of entrances or portals or uh, gates or arches. Yep. Um, like the uh, abandon all hope ye who enter here, right, from Dante. And so there's these like insignias across these and that's you know they're revered people are in guaranteed to go through it it's it's very interesting that i to, just wanted to jump in to create that arch one of, not saying the way but potentially one of a multitude of ways would be again fine-tuning the oscillatory frequency of that tuning fork because it creates the arch in that regard and what you then have by creating the arch is two of them right which speaks well, to the two face right yeah arches are tuning forks upside down right think yes. about it, it it's yes. hooked into the ground and Damn, it, right so you need you would need a in, in one particular hypothesis of many you would need that fork that tuning fork to create the oscillatory resonances of the arch but not only that you want to talk about the the concept of our dna again it's two strands that are two frequency waves that are, again, at right angle vector states based on a postulation of an axiom, meaning that you create the vortice of where you want to start. So you, you start that pillar point and the arch is created within the, like the, 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 the space time metric of what we're living in, which is why to Matt's point, there's the two faces everywhere. And what I find interesting is that Notice, by the way, with all of these two faces, two arches, all of that, you have a space, an empty gap within the, the metaphorical visualizations at the bottom, almost as if when walking through the arch, you're walking through the center. Again, that third strand of DNA, the is, the, there's no good or bad, the isness, if you will. And then you choose which way you want to lean that afterwards, like a pendulum, like the fork. It also means that you are the crucial component in its operation just like what you said about the guys in the star forts the energy of the beings themselves as the electromagnetic conductor and it's what i've talked about with oh. predictive programming this is why i think predictive programming exists we are the powerful ones they have to whisper in our ear what they want us to create and we're so influence we're it's being operated on we're being operated on but our subconscious is is the operating table that's yes. the thing i was thinking that same thing earlier you go. same exact thing we're unraveling Man, when I see ways. these, when I see these arches, like, and you think of like, you know, the earth being round and these like arches placed in, you know, locations all over the world, it looks exactly like the same semantic images that we were just looking at and talking about, like the same, you know, circle in the middle and then putting people in the exact places, the little nodes, you know, around the semantic shape. And it's, it, it, it's just like what we were just looking at. What I love is on the other side of this, whenever this game's over and we all return to source or whatever we think happens, um, we'll get back up there and we'll be asking a series of questions like, and one of them will be this moment. We'll be like, guys, did we get the arches in the second Star Force episode with Matt and everybody? Did we get that right? <laughs> like, no, they were croquet uh, things for us to just, they were for croquets for giants, that game, you know, and they were just hitting big balls through them. And you guys made them all ornate and shit because you're we. So maybe that's what it is, you know. Well, and it, it's funny, Brandon, when you were talking about it before about, you know, the energy of walking through it and that and, and that's basically what this 
this one was. So there was a, a, a Roman named Numa Pompilus who built a, a star fort basically called Ianus Geminus for Ianus. And it was a, a passage that was ritually opened at times of war and then shut when the war was over or when the Roman arms rested. So basically it's an energy to ramp it up and then we'll close it down when we don't need the energy anymore. So yeah, they said, so in, in a time of peace, it was, they, it was close uh, within and it was to keep the peace inside in the time of war. It was said to be open to allow the return of the people on duty. So to let the people back in. But if you think about it energetically, it's that in and out flow of energy and just uh, to the arches real quick, just because I forgot about it. Look at um, these ornate uh, cathedrals. And when you go inside of these things, what are they all propped up by under all of those domes? A series of incredible arches. And what do people say? Even in churches, even if you're not of that religious faith, there's an energy. You feel it when you walk into these buildings like this. And there's just arches everywhere. You think about all the pillars holding all of those things up and the series of them running down those massive cathedrals uh, that, you know, the arches play a huge part in this. I wonder from a philosophical or metaphorical or even metaphysical perspective or standpoint when the gates or the, the, the arches or the whatever, the portals, the stargates, the doors are opened and then closed. I wonder if those, amongst many other possibilities, of course, are metaphors for the concept of the compression and expansion, not of space, but of one's perception. So what you then have is like when hugging somebody, right? You get closer to the door. You, once you get into the door, okay, time to close up shop because you're on the next level, next plane, next dimension, next reality, whatever. And it has to open again during times of, uh, you said it was open during times of war? Yes. Okay. That may, to me, that speaks to the concept of entropy is chaos or randomness in within a vicinity, right? What the God, you know, gods of war, chaos, chaos from nothing, right? A, a creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. So what you have is the expansion, creation from nothing. It's that expansion compression. Just, just yeah, because it's that it's that flow out, right? When you need the energy, and then when the arms are rested and you don't need the energy, you shut it off, you close it down, and there's no need to send anything out anymore. Yep, yeah, it's like the first super soldier program. That's crazy. Yeah, and and so a little deeper. This is the last part of of Janus, but this one kind of tied in because he was supposedly the first king in Italy. He founded Genoa. Well, Genoa was said to be the land of the giants the progeny of the giants so you know gen giant janus you get all this now the interesting thing is though I, and i didn't know this until i i saw paul's video um was that the genoese colonies had a high concentration of star forts and if you look on this map here as to where their rain landed them well, this is, uh, you know, you're looking at Spain, you're looking at the western coast of France, you're looking at southern tip of in, uh, uh, UK over here, and then you go east over into Italy and through the Mediterranean. That's where we saw such a large abundance of these star forts. So there could be a tie there between the two. And it was just something new that I hadn't, I, you know, and again, I'm, I'm learning new, something new, even on these talks i love it so i love that you brought this up too because if you think about it apply it to what the the research that you do with the world's fairs they were used for something different and it was an older thing that we found and said it was something else or we used it for our own yep. devices so this is like an apprehended technology that's not really understood or if it is understood they just don't put the batteries in it they're just like oh it's just a toy but they don't give you the batteries to play with so they're the knowledge is incomplete and so for us they're just uh you shoot people from it and they're like oh okay cool you know what I mean? So it's like this reductive ridiculousness with this. And so, yeah, it's like we found these dope things. They know exactly how they work. That's crazy interesting. And that's why I laugh when they call them batteries, right? Because that's kind of the truth behind it, right? That they're telling you, but they're not telling you. They're like, well, there's a little more to these things. They're, they're batteries, you know? And, and we think, oh, military battery. Right, right. So now this is the fun. This is the fun part that, that Mason was talking about before when we start looking at the water. And, and, and the work that Dr. Emoto did on water and, and how 
different frequencies, different energy that is provided to the water will give you a different shape. It will give you a different outcome. So like we, we look, I mean, look, look at just here, you look at the frog, right? The frog and, and just the pattern that it re resonates out here through it, just sitting in the water. I mean, just that's just straight frequency, just vibrations. And then we'll look at this gentleman right here. This, this one is really interesting. He's just going to use different forks on this table here that he just poured some sand over. That was 2020. And there you go. You get that. Again, we talk about the patterns, the angles, the points that would be. And now he's going to bring in a different. Damn. It's like a Stargate. Yeah. Right. That's what I thought there or the, the virus, right? It looks like ah, that ball with the little tentacles on it. Yep. Like a two dimensional virus. Good call. Just to clarify, what exactly is he doing with these forks? Just, it's he's just vibration. rubbing it on the table. Yeah. So it's a metal table, right? And right. so it creates a yes. vibration, just like dragging, like a singing bowl or something. Right. Where you have a wood stick yep. and it creates a vibration. You know, something I was thinking about, too, is uh, if you think about the human body, we really kind of, if you draw it out, Vitruvian man style, we form a star, right, as, as our bipedalism. And then our hands are fractals of that. And so things get smaller with us as well. Is there anything to, like, we are the star forts, like we are the energetic component here, and that maybe by studying our own ratios, we could then anthropomorphize this to star forge just a question i have no idea or would we be the fractal antenna yeah there exactly. now that you said that when i think about us as a star and you look at your digits right both yep. both your hands and your feet are going to have those fractals on the out outer that's mad oh, yeah. that's a great point I, I didn't even i never thought of that beautiful point wow and that's why we would be the fractal antennas this is why we are the components so that we're the resonant frequency Wow. Yeah, that's brilliant. I like it. So uh, let's see, where were we here? Let's go down to now, if we look at different shapes that they're going to take, this is when they froze under a microscope with different words being said to the water. This is the shapes that they took. Now you notice as they're more positive and they would be different frequency, you're going to get very different shapes um and then you start getting these are all positive up here then you start getting down here into some negatives you see the difference between i can right here which is perfect sacred geometry and then you look at i can't or i cannot and it's broken in half and dissolving which you know, and then if we look over here, you have I love you again, very sacred geome ge geometric. And then look at stupid. It's just a blob. There's no, no patterns to it. No, you know, there's no way of it emanating anything. It's just a, a black hole, essentially. It's broken. Just like if you call someone stupid all the time, it's broken. And this is what we talk about, about words being so damn important. Now, you know, what's interesting, too, is what this is telling us is the frequencies that those words emit. It, it, this is a visual representation of intent. This is you sitting there saying, okay, what love has this pattern. Love has this geometric frequency. Mason, what do you think, dude? Uh, I can't remember if it was before we started recording, but I know we were talking about satellites at some point, and I noticed these negative ones in these photos look a lot more like what our, our satellites resemble, 
with the the stupid one looking you know round almost and uh, i think it says i cannot like that looks it looks exactly like what our you know satellites look like look that's a james webb telescope right there Mm -hmm. with the octagon dude that great good call man Wow, and going to what you were saying a minute ago about like us being in the antennas, I mean, our body is like what seventy five percent water, yep. and what else is our body full of salt, like sodium? When we sweat, like think of the people that go up to the mountains and the sweat lodges, they sweat all over their body, and then that's when they get like the connections with you know the higher ups, you know, and like that, yeah, that's all I'm seeing here. It's just like we're just like transmitters, and then especially if you gather around these star forts, around these concentrated energy areas, whether it's on the ley lines. You know, whether it's going through these like, you know, portals, whatever it is, it's like concentrating the energy into certain places. And this may be what the great deception was all about. These things are out there for us to see. And all of the positive mm-hmm. patterns we're seeing on here represent a physical thing on Earth that are in the form of these star forts. And so they would switch them off to create this dissonance among us. Who, You know, it's like turning off the dopamine drip. You know, it's just like shut down the good vibes and let's see what happens. And then now they're controllable and now they're all this. And then you perturb it by the non, you know, natural frequencies. And that's what they're pumping out. You know, and this is this, you know, kind of if you take this on a long scale like it cycles and all that good stuff but there's been stuff left behind from another culture that we think knew this man and that's matt's argument i i think it's awesome dude there's just so much to this cool so here here's another one of the we'll look at the uh sacred geometry again and and cymatics and how these different sounds have different effects Cymatics is the science of revealing the architecture of sound. Here we have sand on a metal plate, and if you change the frequency of the sound, you can see complex patterns forming. Zooming in even closer on these patterns, you can see what looks like galaxies. The Sufi mystic Hazrat Nayat Khan said, Divine sound is the cause of all manifestation. The knower of the mystery of sound knows the mystery of the whole universe. It has also been said that sound is architecture frozen in time. So you may want to ask yourself, what type of invisible architecture are you embedding into your subconscious with the music that you listen to? I want you to really, really think about this. What did he say there? Sound is the frozen sound is the architecture of time? architecture yes. of sound. I've heard that before. Cool. Now, another thing to this is the perturbance of the musical frequencies. In 52, I think it switched uh, to become officially 440 or A, um, which is, you know, uh, perturbance. It was 432 before, and it was a much more natural resonance, and you can actually get things that'll play your music in 432 to mimic natural things rather than this. And even Kanye West uh, came out and said the 808 beat machine was specifically designed to cause low frequencies. And so this is where the music comes in. Not only that, the spell casting in the lyrics as well. Anything like shoot them in the face and whatever. Whatever sort of low vibe, you know, not against natural law type of, you know, environment that you want to put out in your music, you also couple that with the perturbance of frequencies designed to make it sink in and to make it more dissonant for you. It's it's a perturbance, man. It's 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 interesting they've been doing the same thing with movies for years. Like I learned because I I've done everything from music production myself to film editing. And I learned years ago about how they use the lower, like very low frequencies embedded in horror films to create extra sense of tension or disgust or like whatever negative emotion. Yeah. Can you imagine the bio resonance that emits off the people in the movie theater when watching that to your point, Mason? Exactly. Yeah. And that's the loosh. That's the loosh. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. That is it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, here's one more example of some cymatics, just some cool little frequency pieces.
I just want to point out as we're watching this Watts music um, that it said as it increases in frequency, the pattern gets more complex. And if you think of this in, in uh, your slide 66 in relation to the chakra system, your lower bass chakra is low frequency, low vibe, very uh, bass emotions, very simple, right? It's like food and fuck. And then you get more complicated or more complex rather uh, as you ascend in the chakras. And this is what they say the 144,000 is all about in the Bible and everything. It's not actual physical people here. If you add up the petals on all of the lotuses within your chakra system, it is numerically equivalent to 144,000. And so this is what they're talking about. You are the 144,000 by aligning all of your chakras. But it is interesting that as the physical tone raises, it increases in complexity, just like people say and articulate that your chakra system denotes as well. It's just like when we think that it's physical, what we're you know, touching a physical table, but it's okay. It's like, okay, if we put aside the splicing of the hairs of, you know, defining uh, physical and etymology and all of this, and, you know, the philosophical and metaphysical implications or even ontological implications, it's like um, a denser astral frequency string, if you will, which was why I was saying earlier, the concept of, you know, electromagnetic frequencies being what maybe ancient cultures potentially could have called the sort of organic magic based on wherever one focused their intent. But not only that, to add to what you said about the, um, the, the lower two chakras, uh, Brandon, about the, like the, the food and fuck chakras, actually, I got to be honest with you, that's actually, thank you so much for saying that, because I've been reading lately that it's been alleged, I'm not saying as a fact, but it's been alleged that the fourth uh, dimensional uh, reptilian entities that are just outside of our light spectrum from us being able to see relative to the photonic information structure, they attach themselves to the lower two chakras of the human body, allegedly. Yes, this a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because yes, and they're lower base. So if there is some, and this is though what points us to some sort of harvest here or whatever. Now I think that it, once you ascend through that, you're no longer harvestable because you don't taste good to those entities. Like you're not seasoned right. You know that they, they want the low vibe stuff, and so you kind of escape that as an option for yourself by raising your frequency. But with that also comes again the more complexities because when you get into your heart this is now you're talking about clearing ancestral trauma this is talking about working through more complex emotions right or more uh, it takes more nuance and so there's more to it again physically represented by a raising of a frequency it's so cool yeah there's less density to feed off of the more you raise your frequency the more like the lighter be you become and, the, and to, in, in my opinion these entities feed off of density and I wonder if that's why it's also when someone, again, not, not advocating for this, but um, there have been instances where people have, you know, taken, you know, uh, magic mushrooms, and then they'll do a, a DMT trip in the middle of that mushroom experience. And they claim that when they do DMT while on the mushrooms, literally, they can feel their not only pineal gland muscle activate, but their astral body shoot right up. And so I wonder if that speaks to, again, the concept of, you know, the, 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 the right angle, you know, the cone, the squirt gun shooting right through. And in addition to that, again, not shooting upwards, feeling people claim to feel lighter once they shoot upwards. So, yeah. And think about this is visually represented. I lighten your load, uh, relieve your burden, you know, carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, the Atlas model. And this is a lower shocker, lower density uh, thing. Mm -mm. And there's definitely something to it, right? I mean, you, you, you feel it when you're in that lower chakra vibration, you're attracting that lower chakra vibration, right? And then, you know, from, from what Dave was talking about before, think about how many partners you found in that low vibration state. And the only way to get out of it is just to cut that tie completely. But there's something that keeps drawing you back into that. And that goes into that. You, you, you saying before, David, that those entities might connect to that lower, that lower area. And, and that makes total sense. Wow. Yeah, so what we have here is just the planets and, and what their frequencies would resemble. And I thought that was kind of interesting because, again, we see that same type of pattern here, that same vibrations and, and sequence that they all have the different sacred geometric patterns but when you get to the core the core is solid right there's that one point at the middle and then everything emanates out from there and i, I just found that that interesting because that ties in as we go a little deeper and start looking at oh 
things like the rose windows, right? We, we start looking at the churches and, and what are the purposes of these windows? Why do they resemble different frequency patterns and were they used to emanate these frequencies or harness these frequencies? That's, you know, that's the the talk that's out there, right? Think about this too. Uh, What, what is that? Uh, why are you able to see the colors because of light and what do they talk about uh, mason you could speak on this the uh, uh, light codes and so could this be an amplification a perturbance an interruption a capture and reappropriation of those light codes and energy or a focal i definitely think it could be an amplification because if you think about like especially the cathedrals like the way that they amplify sound like back in the day we didn't have audio systems yet like those places just like have the most incredible like you know, reverb and like sound space and like, you know, you can clap your hands and it echoes throughout the whole place. So I definitely think there's a concentration of energy there, just like in the pyramids. But, you know, whether that's a, it's a good concentration of energy or bad, I don't know. I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic churches and they didn't all have a good vibe. I can tell you that. Well, yeah. And one of the things that's interesting is, is uh, my, my friend Emmanuel Kingman, who does the uh, the Godcast? He he was he's been talking about this too, and he said, you know, a lot of these cathedrals back in the day too didn't have the glass in there, that these were likely empty, so they would have the wind and the air come through in that pattern, and 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 behind many of these windows is what that's where they would have the organ or the bell, and and so as they played these organs, that sound would emanate out through these windows, and that would be the frequency that you were emanating for the area. That was that's one of his theories on this. Yes, like the stained glass or glass was added later as a distraction. They're like, yeah, this is what this was, or or an impediment, you. right? And, Something and to absolutely. block it. Yes, yep. absolutely to block it, but also to not make you want to take it off because it's so beautiful and ornate. Why would you want to destroy that? That's yep. fascinating, dude. Yeah, so that's that's another one of these angles. And one of the things that you do see in a lot of the star forts is you see cathedrals in, in inside these buildings. I mean, we look in here and we'll see all sorts of different structures. But again, this, the, we, we try and tie all these things in. We look at the, the, the water patterns, right? We go back to a moto. We go back to the different... Um, uh fields that we talked about in the first episode around it now are they being impacted we it it almost seems like it's impossible for them not to be impacted by these structures that are around the outside of it and then on the other side of it also how do you build something this perfect from in, in a time when you you're not supposed to have an aerial view now some would argue there were airships at the time. So they did have the ability to have an aerial view, but how good could they take that aerial view and relay it same time down to the ground level? I, I don't mean yeah. to oversimplify, uh, but I wonder, sorry, Brandon, I don't mean to oversimplify, but I wonder if we take the scaling up concept of the video of the guy with the fork, except literally it size it up on a much larger piece of land instead of a table. For example, mm. now I'm maybe I'm, I'm certainly sure I'm oversimplifying, but the idea would be that again, for example, the same way that one needs, you know, a blueprint as the foundational parameter or, or basis or paradigm for that structure, what one maybe could have done was take the fork literally over top again, using other methods, uh, creating uh, what did that uh, gentleman use? What was on the table that allowed that form to salt? Salt. Okay. Taking something like salt, for example, something far more dense that could be, uh, again, split apart or disseminated in a fractal sense across, you know, many uh, kilometers or or blocks or feet, you name it, and then walk to wherever that salt was or wherever that material landed to based on the tuning of the forks and placing the objects over top in that way. Now, it's just a thought, but I, I'm j- again, I'm sure I'm making, you know, t- leaps here, but yeah. Well, this is a good question, though. How long has cymatics been around? How long have they been sprinkling granules of stuff on a metal plate? And then, and then, you know, that's a very low tech way that the guy was doing it. I know that the contact between Tibetan singing bowls has been around for quite a while. So maybe that same principle was applied flattened out, maybe even accidentally, or like a, 
like an oracle or something. You know, they would have this trick, you know, where they like sprinkle something and then they rub and they go, oh, don't go into battle right now. Uh, you know, and another thing that I would just wanted to touch on real quick, Matt, is to what you said about the airships. How long had they been around? How long had the technique and skill required to observe something from the air, this survey? Because it's a totally different environment for these people to build in and to use as a framework to build in. So this is a skill that would have been, you know, in my mind, again, not something that in your first hot air balloon ride up, you're like, oh, I could take a huge thing and plot it and drop it down there with accurate laser precision. So this seems like a skill that would have been acquired. So yeah, maybe airships were there. But I mean, you know, we, we're just now figuring out how to drive some of us and cars have been around for quite a while. You know what I mean? So true. So true. So kind of, you know, I don't mean to question these, uh, the engineering capabilities of these people, but it seems like this is a skill that would have been taken a little bit of a time to acquire. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, when I, when I, I, when Paul talked about the whole Janus connection, it's like, oh, if you had a, you know, godly connection there that was helping you create these, well, then obviously life's going to be a lot easier. And, and to that point, uh, you think of things like the Nazca lines and stuff like that. I mean, um, you know, Serpent Mound, all of these things that are more viewed from above, but, you know, perhaps. And then people reported things in the sky. So, again, if, if we kind of think of this place as being recycled, old cultures, and, like, some shit gets left behind, some doesn't or whatever, then maybe that's what this is. Like, there were the ability to fly, you know, from something else. Now, this could also involve non-human intelligences and crop circles and things like that. I mean, these are things that are implanted, we think, from the sky uh, in an aerial fashion, and then patterns emerge on the ground. So there well, could be a tie-in. And that makes me think of the pyramids, Brandon, because right, you, you think of the, the three main pyramids in Egypt, and, and they are in the shape of Orion's belt, or in the pattern, right, to match Orion's belt. And it's like, well, why? Why, why would they have to build it to match the stars if there wasn't something more to it? it, it you know, And that's why I, I tend to believe that you know, those things had a lot more power behind them so to speak than, than we know about and the layout of the giza pyramids i know that they've laid it side by side with a circuit board and it's identical and you pointed that out with the materials and when you reference limestone and granite earlier with building the uh, pyramids and then you had the um, circuit board right next to it man and so yes from above they kind of look like a circuit board just like our modern cities and all that stuff it just yep. depends on what the circuit's wired to you know all the different elements of it depending on what its power is you know what it's powering what it's maybe influence one could say is that speaks to what matt was saying about transistors exactly yep and that's that that gets us into these and this is just some examples where you know or an example here where we we see the pattern almost to a t from the center point all the way out to the points, they are almost identical. Um, so we get back into, again, the, the different points, the different frequencies, what, what could it possibly be emitting? There's just all sorts of interesting things. And then you get into these, which are the, the cities, right? This is just Geneva, but you look at the size and the scope of it. I mean, this is just, amazing you look at the layers you have one two three basically four layers to get to land here and then not not only that it makes you wonder was this at one time an entire star fort star city and it was eroded and destroyed and or broken or was this how it was initially set up that's another one of those things that lays out there as kind of a open-ended question Forgive me if I'm off here, but I think this is roughly the same location that CERN is now located in. It's uh, Geneva, close. right outside of it. Yep. Yeah. Right it, outside. Yes. It's got to be close to. It needs to be. I believe it's close to water because, again, nothing publicly stated, but it seems that water is very necessary. Honestly, it just seems like there's layered on top modern versions of the star forts, except again labeled as you know nonsense to the layman, but. And if you keep stacking these things, eventually they, you know, if you draw the lines up, even from the angles of the walls, they'll form a point. They meet at some point, which goes right. then back to Dave, what you've been talking about, about the, the, the Dave, uh, Dan, Dan Winter's work with the focal point, with the cone, with everything, you know? Yeah. And, and, and if you think of these things on a, you know, on an ethereal level, and then you think about something, um, you know, you look at some of these large scale, uh, disasters 
And you're like, oh, well, what if that was what destroyed the natural grid and which kind of set us back into that next reset? So there's there's all sorts of crazy. I mean, one of the events would, would be like the Carrington event, right? Like in the in the late 1860s, where you know you, you supposedly had these massive electrical pulses that went out and supposedly you know it fried everything and that's that's what we could be seeing today is this is the remnants of what they you know after they fried everything yeah i've talked about this like if humanities uh like if an emp goes off uh escape from la style or whatever then uh, you know we if if i'm like we're screwed with cell phones i don't know how to make one you know what i mean like that technology is just gone to us we we just don't have that anymore apologies guys and so yeah it seems like it just wipes everything out and perhaps there's even an amnesia associated with this this could be like a physical thing that occurred with the beings here it's where this technology like was wiped out of memory well, you know there's that, like a group amnesia that would speak to uh, to to what we call today plank that zero point scale it's in every aspect of not just the uh uh the space-time metric, but everywhere around that we look, which could speak to, again, the concept of the toroid field collapsing, but in a destructive way. So the yeah. concept would be that philosophically, metaphysically, and platonically, when someone uh, self-implodes after that sort of reset, if you will, what you then have is if, if they're still traumatized to things that have, been, that have occurred in their past, what, you, what happens is you have what Dan Winters says is supposed to happen, non-destructive self-implosion. However, because of traumas and all of this, those, those memories are oscillating and resonating in a very disarrayed way. So what you then have is like cymatic ripple effects via thought forms, via non-local intent. So then all of a sudden you can't fit into that cone or that, that center of the toroid field because you must address the issues in which we call trauma, anxiety, stress, depression, that again, seems to still be within this plane or, or realm in that, uh, in that regard. Damn, like ghosts too. Like they have unfinished business, they can't cross over. Well, this could also mm. speak to the concept of the of the, of the right angle triangle or or the Lorentz not boost but Lorentz vector scalar state frame because as uh, the astrophysicist Alexei Novitsky has proposed, he's of the opinion. Um, I'm not sure if he still is, but I think he is that the one's shadow baseline or, or one's one's shadow, the baseline of that shadow is the furthest in which that paranormal entity can extend itself to within an entropic vicinity because the light spectrum is limiting the reach. The same way that we can't we can't envision shapes that we've never seen before because again, as, as the examples I've always given, try you know popping into existence and showing up at a at like a house party. How do you know you're having a good time if you never had a bad one? Right. Right. Try explaining what water looks like to a baby. It's the same. OK, well, it's blue. OK, what's blue? Yeah. Well, you know, it's like shit. Well, <laughs> you got to see it. Yeah. And also to, to your point as well, uh, uh, Brandon, about the, you know, a resetting of the memory of, of you know, on, in a grand collective scale. We could say, for example, you know, these phones. Right. Imagine mm -hmm. if this occurred in the same regard. We could have a, you know, a, a version of Matt, a version of you, me, you know, a Mason 500 years from now and all of us doing a slideshow in their own format or version of what were these magic boxes they had. Yes. You know, yes. Yep. yeah. Like the purses we see in all the old, uh, the you know, watches. carvings and everything. Yes. Oh, yeah. The purses, the watches, the pine cone, we kind of, you know, can, can guess. But yes, there's a technology there that we don't understand. Right. Yep. And this is why, like, in the ancient Egyptians, they had, you know, allegedly the laptop, right, with the two USB ports carved in there. And, you know, all of these technologies, uh, the hieroglyphs that they've written off as being written over, but they're like helicopters and atomic bombs and all kinds of stuff, man. Modern machinery that, you know, even Da Vinci was like, man, that'd be kind of cool if we made one of those. Maybe he get his idea from that. Maybe it's an old technology that we just lost and that it, you know, these same ideas, you know, again, as above, so below. And it's kind of like we get a little bit better or we get to try it again differently. Again, it's like resetting a simulation, changing a factor and then just running it and seeing what what occurs differently wiping the thing clean and then just running a new one, you know, but kind of not really tidying up. And that may be part of the experience as well. Maybe they leave the shit on purpose, kind of like for us to figure out like, okay, we're going to wipe the mines and let's see if they can figure it out. It's, it's like the equivalent of dropping a nuclear reactor in the stone age, man. That would speak to defense mechanism testing in, in, in what's called perceptionetics, but yeah. Damn. 
Yeah, and it's, it's, I mean, it's like your character in a video game, right? You start out with very little, you build up through, and then once you master the game, okay, well, here's the next challenge. We're going to give you a new one, and, and you keep going on, and it's a never-ending cycle. Very interesting. So, yeah, I, I just have a couple more examples here of, of some crazy forts um, that Anyone we've had here. This one is in from these. I love this. It, they remind me of throwing stars. Anybody? I mean, the yes, identical. It's like like something Leonardo left around, left, left hanging out, or Michelangelo, or whoever. Right, and also, sorry guys, not, not, the, not not to be the uh, the party pooper, but I was just thinking after you're done with your presentation, maybe we could wrap it for this episode, if, because we're approaching the two hour mark, and I don't want to, for the sake of how much dense information is here, I don't want to, you know. Yeah, no, I'm I'm. I'm good. I just had examples that I was just going to show. So, you know, from the Statue of Liberty to whatever. So we are, I am good from this point. There's nothing more than just a few, uh, few different examples of some forts. So if you're ready to wrap, feel free. Statue uh, of Liberty is a good pull, Matt. Yeah. These are, these are incredible images. I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. The statue, I didn't build that pattern. Never knew or thought of that with the Statue of Liberty, to be honest with you. Not at all. This, that, yeah. Wow. Something I do want to tease for the next episode that we, I'm very excited about uh, is liquefaction. We're going to talk about it, um, the earthquakes, the the possibility that that's how things, it may explain upas, those hammers that they find in 400 million year old coal from an old civilization that liquefaction occurred, swallowed up the ground, and there's so much more to that, and we're just going to tear it apart. We're going to melt faces with our liquefaction on the next one. Oh man, I can't wait. This is gonna, I can't wait. Please, so I, cool. I'm gonna so write, deep. I'm gonna write that down just in case. Liquefaction, yeah. that's great. Yes. So, anybody out there listening, just kind of, you know, take a look at the concept and the idea, and um, uh, we'll, we'll touch on it as a, as a collective next time we get together. Awesome. I did want to ask, I did want to go through each and every one of you to let uh, our audience on our side know uh, where and how uh, Matt, Brandon, and Mason, if you would like as well, brother, where you guys can be found and, and be uh, contacted at, if anyone's interested in your guys' work. Uh, yeah, I'll go first. You can, sure, yeah, you can find me at, at the Great Deception Podcast. Uh, I'm on Instagram, YouTube. I have a Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash the Great Deception Podcast. Uh, you can email me the great deception podcast at Gmail. Um, but you know, the easiest way go to, go to my Instagram at the great deception podcast. My link tree link is in there and you can contact me right through DM there. Anyone, please don't hesitate to reach out or respond to everybody. I love the interaction with everyone. And, uh, Dave, Brandon, Mason, nice to meet you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Matt. Your, your, your work, and I, I want to say this uh, to even the audience, to everyone's audience as, as well. Matt's work is fantastic. It's a very vital element to what, uh, to what we're doing here, in my opinion. So thank you so much. And of course, Brandon, brother, where can you be found? Dude, could not agree more about Matt. So thank you so much, Matt, for doing this. Dude, we're so excited. This is so cool. Uh, and I highly recommend everyone go listen to Matt's show for damn sure. Uh, okay, yes, uh, you can find me at expandingrealitypodcast.com. I made it very easy on you guys. Just go there. It's got everything, and it's a star for it to everything else out around it as well. Awesome. And Mason, by any chance, is there anything you wanted to uh, promote uh, yeah. like this? Oh, uh, like? yeah, sure. Um, you know, up until this, I've been kind of working, uh, you know, off the air, you know, but I have a, my Telegram community, uh, Human Beings. And my Instagram uh, at human beings. If anybody wants to follow me, send me a message, anything. Uh, hopefully, you know, I'll be part of some future conversations and, and can get my own, you know, some content going as well on my YouTube channel. Mason's uh, Telegram group chat is absolutely fantastic. I, I encourage everybody to, to check it out. In addition to, uh, I think, I believe also our great friend Dan and um, his group chat as well. In addition to, I think, uh, Jay Marie's as well. So again, I, I want to give a shout out to all of them. Fantastic stuff. And um, of course, for myself, uh, patreon.com slash generation Z for Matt and Brandon's audiences and um, uh, at podcast Z on Twitter, generation Z podcast, no space, no capitals on Instagram. And of course, if you type in generation Z podcast, Z E D um, on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, I will be there as well. And uh, I cannot thank you guys enough for this. This has been an absolute blast, truly. Outstanding, guys. Awesome. Outstanding. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys, and we'll catch you all next time. Thank you all.